the title of this series, by the way, is called People of the Way. People of the Way. And I want to start today's message uh, by just kind of laying the foundation of why I decided to call it People of the Way. I had so many different titles. You can ask Pastor Stephen and my wife. They were in my brainstorming room with me as I'm on a whiteboard writing down all these different ideas of what I think this this series should be, and I eventually landed on this idea of people of the way. And so the reason why I call it the people of the way is because when you think about people who follow Jesus, um, there are titles, there's names given to those people that follow Jesus. Um, so when you think of somebody who follows Jesus, what do you think of them? What, what, what's a word to describe them? They're, they're what? A Christian? Any other words? That use? Disciple? Yeah? Yeah? Follower of Jesus? Yes? Some people call them Church people, right? All different words that are used to describe followers of Jesus. Um, some call them hypocrites. <laughs> um, we'll get to that in this series too. <clears throat> but did you know that the first century, the first followers of Jesus were given a nickname? And I want to show you what that nickname was as we look in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 is where we're going to go. You should have some paper notes, hopefully, when you walked in here. Um, if you're online, you can also get the online notes. You can go on our app and pull this up. And uh, I want us to read these verses together. Acts chapter 9, verse 2, it says this. He, this is speaking of Saul, before Saul had a transformation. Saul, uh, he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of the, of what? Any of the? Followers of the followers of the way he found there. Followers of the way. Now, you need to understand something that our Western Christianity culture has made uh, following Jesus an event. It's, it's something you do on Sundays, and then you go about doing your own life throughout the week. But according to the first century church, they were described not as Christians. Christians came way down the line. Uh, they were called followers of the way. And the reason they were called followers of the way was because there was a way that these people lived their life that was so different than everybody else that they called them the followers of the way. This wasn't just a group of enlightened people that had this new belief. No, these people were radically transformed in such a way that people said the way they live and the way everybody else lives are two totally different ways. That's why they're called the followers of the way. They loved selflessly. They served humbly. They gave generously. They embraced difficulty in such a countercultural way. And this countercultural way was so transformative that this guy that wrote, that, that said this, that requested this, Saul, had an encounter with Jesus and had an encounter with the people of the way. And look what happened just a couple of chapters later. We find out in Acts 24, it says, Paul says this. He says, so, but I admit that I follow the way. So there's something about the way that the way lived that it transformed Saul's heart and he became Paul and he began to follow the way. And what united the followers of the way or the people of the way was not a philosophy, it was a person. And that person described himself this way in John 14, verse 6, when he said, Jesus told them, I am, come on, say it again, I am the way, the, way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way. These are the followers of the way. What is the way that he is speaking of? What, what is this way? I, I believe it's so much more than the way to heaven. There's so much more to what Jesus is calling us into than just trying to get you fire insurance to get to heaven. Come on, somebody. Jesus did not come just so we wouldn't go to hell. There is a way of living that he's called us to live in, that he lived in his life. And if you look at the start of Jesus' ministry, he introduces us 
to this way in Mark chapter one, the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, he says, I'm going to now introduce you to the new way. And here is the new way. It says, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. And everybody say these red letters. And the what? And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus was coming, watch this, not to introduce a religion. Jesus was not coming to introduce rituals. Jesus was not coming to introduce rules. Jesus was coming to introduce relationship. Jesus was coming to introduce a a new way of doing things, the kingdom way. He says, there is a certain way that you're living, but I'm coming to introduce the kingdom way. And and every time we say the word kingdom, most time people think heaven. But I'm telling you, the kingdom is not just heaven. There is so much more that God has for us when it's being lived the kingdom way. And the the way that we live uh, uh, according to the life of Jesus, watch this, here's the way. The way is inner transformation, not behavior modification. And what end up people want to do is they want to follow Jesus and they want to have behavior modification. I want God to make me a little bit better than I actually am. And God goes, no, 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 I'm not going to make you better. I'm going to make you new. I'm going to change you from the inside to the outside. Everything's going to be different. I don't want to just come and make you look better on the outside. I want to, I'm going to introduce something so new to you that it's going to transform you on the inside and then your outside's going to change as well. I love Pastor Ryan sat with our staff the other day and he was telling us, how many enjoyed Pastor Ryan last week as he shared a story about what God's walked him through. It's so powerful. And he shared this uh, illustration. I thought, man, it's so powerful. He says, you know, most people want to go from being a caterpillar to a better caterpillar. Jesus says, I'm not making you a caterpillar. I'm making you a butterfly. This is what God's desire for us is that we move from not just being a good caterpillar to a better looking caterpillar, but we literally are transformed from the inside out. And when people look at us to go, the way you live is way different than they used to. And you go, it's exactly right because I am different than I used to. This is what God has called us to be. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to rediscover together what it looks like for us in 2022 to be people of the way. And maybe, just maybe, while many of us have lost our way, it's time for us to find our way back. And that's my prayer, that those who have lost their way, you feel, man, I'm just, I'm out in a totally different place, not where I used to be, that God would help you find your way back. And then number two, those who maybe uh, have, are just lost all in general that you would understand that there is a greater way to live your life than the way that you're currently living, and Jesus has so much to say about it. So today, we're gonna look at a story in Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five, verse one through 11 is where we're gonna go today if you wanna read along with me. And I wanna introduce us to when Jesus shows up on the scene and when he invites his first followers These guys who would eventually be described as followers of the way, what they were doing before they were followers of the way, and then what was it that caused them to become followers of the way, and we're going to see some some characteristics of Jesus and the way that he lived, but then also the people who followed him and what they had to do and what they became uh, to be followers of the way. Of the way. So Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to start today. And it says this One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Look what the next verse says. And he notices, what does he notice? <clears throat> Two empty boats. Two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. So just take all this stuff into your mental frame here as you're thinking about it. Jesus is preaching. So many people are. Are, are pressing in on him. He's backing up, backing up. He's on the beach side. There's two boats that are there. Both are empty because the tenants of those boats, the owners of those boats, are off washing their nets. <clears throat> Stepping into one of the boats, uh, notice, by the way, it says Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat <clears throat> and taught the crowds from there. 
So he pushed away, a little bit away. Everybody keeps pressing in. And I don't know, Jesus was like, hey, I got to give me some space. And he back up a little bit. And uh, he, so he backs up. And here he is on the boat, on the water, and he's preaching to them. And when he had finished speaking to them, he says to Simon, now, hey, let's go out. Let's, let's go out in the deep. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go do some deep, deep sea fishing. <clears throat> and he says, and I want you to let down your nets to catch some, some fish. So here we are in this, in this moment, <clears throat> and Jesus is asking him to catch some fish. Now, this is a, this is a pretty big deal because he says, look what, what uh, Simon says to him. He says, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night, and we didn't catch a thing. Now, <clears throat> here's the problem with this scenario, and I want you to think about yourself in this scenario. Um, what has Simon been doing all night? It wasn't a trick question, y'all. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Doing taxes? I don't know. He was fishing, okay? He was fishing. He was fishing. And, uh, and so he's come in from an exhausting day. Simon is a professional fisherman. Okay, this is what he does for a profession. It's what his father's done for a profession. So I'm sure it's what his grandfather's done for a profession. It's been, been it's a passed down occupation. And so here he is. He's, he, he's done it all night. Okay, professional fishermen. Let me just ask just for a quick moment. I'm not a professional fisherman, but I've been out with professional guides that fish for a living and different things. Do professional fishing guides usually know where fish are? Yes or no? Yes, yes. okay. Do they usually know when to fish? Yes, okay. Do they know where to fish? Do they know how to fish? Yes, okay, all right. So every time I've been out with guides, uh, they'll usually tell me like, hey, this is a good time to go fish. I need you to be here at this time because we're gonna go fish during this time because this is the best time in which we get. Okay, so this is Simon. Simon's been doing this his whole life. He knows when he's going to catch fish. He knows where fish are going to be caught. He knows it all. Except this night that he went out and did everything that he normally does, he didn't catch anything at all, and so he came back and he was exhausted. And if you remember the story of when this all happened, what was Simon doing when Jesus was preaching? Anybody remember? He was washing his nets. You know what washing your nets signifies, right? I'm done for the day. <laughs> I'm done for the day, okay? I've been doing this all night. Uh, I'm a little exhausted, and I'm also a very a bit disturbed by the fact that I didn't bring anything home. Now, realize they weren't just catching fish just for, uh, for food. I mean, no, they were catching fish for a job. So he's frustrated on the job site because he's, he's not bringing in any money for the day. And he's also not bringing any fish for his family for the day. So there's a lot of emotions, I'm sure, in the moment. And how many know when you're tired and you're exhausted and then you did all this work and you get nothing, how many know how you feel? Anybody know how you feel? Well, just ask your kids. They'll tell you how you feel. Okay. So, so you can imagine. He's done. And here this Jesus guy shows up. And he's preaching to everybody. And he has the audacity to step up into my boat, and he didn't even ask me. Think about that for a moment. He didn't ask. He steps up into Simon's boat, and then, he, and then Simon, I'm sure, comes over there, figure out what, why, why is there a guy in my boat, and then he says, hey, we're gonna push out, so he just pushes out, <clears throat> and then after he gets done preaching, then he says, hey, let's go fish. Okay, so first off, I just cleaned the nets. I'm a little tired. I'd like to probably get something to eat. Oh, and by the way, what do you do? Oh, you're a carpenter. <laughs> hey, listen, if I have a wobbly chair, I'll ask you how to fix it. You don't tell me how to fish. <laughs> Come on, somebody. How many of you just feeling that right there for a moment? They'd be like, if you're a farmer and I came out there and I said, hey, you need to go and pick up everything now. You'd be like, you stick to preaching and I'll farm. So I just want to paint the scenario of what's happening here. You've got a carpenter telling a fisherman how to do his job. And yet, the next verse says, watch this, because this is, this is huge for here. He says, but if you say so, but if you say so, I'm gonna let down the nets again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish that they begin to tear. Now, I want you to go back, go back. We're not gonna go yet. I want you to see something here. What Simon doesn't know is that one decision 
to obey Jesus would change his life forever. The one moment where he just pauses and has to make the decision, do I just tell this guy, get the heck off my boat, or do I just go ahead and go with what he says? That one moment where you can go either way, and of course we know the story here, that he goes the other way, changes his life forever. Here's the lesson that we learn. You never know what's on the other side of your obedience. Simon didn't know that there was going to be uh, all this full net of fish that was going to happen. He had no look at that. And how many of you can uh, look back over your life and you look at decisions that you have made and you didn't realize that at the point that you made it, how historically it was going to transform the trajectory of your life into a different way. Maybe it was moving into a different house. Maybe it was moving to a different city. Maybe it was you getting fired from a job but you taking another job somewhere else and you look at your life now. Maybe it was a decision to go on a date with one guy and now you realize I'm married to that guy. And if you did not know, some of you are like, yeah, I'm regretting that one. Okay, so... <laughs> It's all right, go back to red flags, we can deal with that, okay, and come back to that. But how many know that one decision, that one thing that Jesus is asking you to do, you don't know what's on the other side of it, which by the way, I just wanna go ahead and pre-warn you if you're not a follower of Jesus, oftentimes Jesus will ask for your obedience before he ever shows you why he's asking for it. So he's going, hey, I want you to lead this. Hey, I want you to go talk to him. Hey, I want you to pause right here. Hey, I don't want you to post that. Hey, I want you to do this. Hey, I want you. And you're like, "Ah, I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Jesus, don't you know? And he's like, yeah, I know. But there's things that I know that you don't know because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. And if you would understand that my ways is better than your ways, you'd say yes. And Simon didn't realize, but he soon realized that his yes was about to change his life forever. So I say all that just to say, don't despise very small decisions. Small decisions can radically change your life. Because look what the rest of this verse says. It says, so he's full of fish. They begin to tear. Keep going. It says, and a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. So now his yes not only affected him, it affected all the everybody, everybody else. So everybody else is coming. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. And the next verse says, and when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees. We'll come back to this in just a minute. Fell to his knees before Jesus. And he said, oh, oh, oh. Please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Verse 9 says this, and so, for when he was all struck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. And so this is what he's realizing in this moment. This guy is not just a carpenter. Something about this man, which is why he doesn't just call him, oh man, he calls him, oh Lord. For he was all struck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. And verse 10 says, And his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. And verse 11 says this, And as soon as they landed, all right, here's where we're going. They and they left everything and they followed Jesus. All right. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this thought down. Here's the one big thought for today, and that is that the way of Jesus is total surrender. The way of Jesus is total surrender. If we're going to be people of the way, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be disciples, be Christians, whatever we want to call it, the, the way of Jesus is total surrender. Okay, so we have to define surrender because these guys left everything. Now think about that for a moment. When we say they left everything, they left their nets They left their families. If you go read in Mark, uh, the story of this, you can go read in all the gospels. They have different versions of this story of how this played out. But it says not only did they leave their nets, which by the way is their occupation, but they also left their families. They left everything. They left their livelihood. They left everything that they had built. They left their community. They left everything to follow Jesus. This is the way of Jesus is this idea of total surrender. 
And so here's, let's, let's look at a definition. If you want to write down a, a working definition of surrender, here's, here's surrender. Surrender is to yield to the power and the control of another, to give up completely or agree to forgo, to abandon or relinquish. This is the idea of surrender, to yield to the power and control of another. That's white flag, I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. To give up completely or agree to forgo, meaning I give this over to you, I surrender this to you, or to abandon or relinquish, just to say I'm done, throw in the towel, I'm done. All right, moment of honesty yet again, here we go. Show of hands, those online join us here. How many of you in here struggle with control. Raise your hand right now if you struggle with control. Okay, yeah, 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 all right. If that's you online, raise your hand if you struggle with control. Uh, you might say, well, Pastor Jess, I don't really struggle with control. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just aggressively um, helpful. <laughs> I'm aggressively helpful. Or you just say, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm thoroughly organized. Just, just really, th I'm overly thoroughly organized. Now listen, let me just say this right now. If any of y'all raise somebody else's hand, you will have a control <laughs> issue. Okay. Control, we all like control. Culture tells us to be in control. It tells us to be in charge. It tells us to make it happen. It tells us you gotta do it. If you wanna get anywhere in life, you've gotta do it, you've gotta do it, you've gotta do it. And, and so you've been maybe bred into this culture and maybe your parents were like that. Like you gotta work for yourself, you gotta do your own thing. And so I'm gonna take charge kind of person. And uh, depending on how you maybe were raised, if you were maybe, especially if you were independently raised and you kinda had to grow up fast. I mean, you were just, everything had to kind of be in your control. And what you fail to realize is that like, everything because of your control you are often taking this into all areas of your life you got to control your home and you've got to control your spouse and you've got to control your kids and you've got to control your money and you've got to control your job and you've got to control your finances and you've got to control your future and and what you will find out real quickly in life is like the more that we try to control the more we fear we're losing control the more we fear we're losing control the more we try to control more the more we try to control more the more we fear we lose control and do you see how the cycle just happens more and more and and more and more, and one moment at some place, you're going to realize you're not as in control as you think you are. You're not as in control as you think you are, but uh, the spirit of this world is, is that you are in full control of everything. Now, of course, there are things that are, are within our control. I'm not gonna say that there are not areas that you are within control by all means, but if you are a bit of a controlling person, if you like to have things a certain way and done a certain way and everything's gotta be your way, I'm just gonna tell you, at some point in life, you will be so exhausted of being in control. Watch this. You are trying to control your spouse for so long that your spouse says they don't wanna be with you anymore. You try to control your finances so much that every time the, the, the gas prices are going up, you're freaking out. Stocks are going down, you're freaking out. The hint of possible layoffs, you're freaking out because I've got to have some stuff under, under control. As soon as someone gets sick, you just start freaking out like, what, what are we going to do? And, uh, it's, it's probably cancer. It's prob you just immediately go to the, anybody know people like that? You just go to the immediate extremes. Don't get on WebMD. That's not helpful, okay? Don't get on there. We try to control, we try to control our kids in, in so many different ways. And, you know, and, and yet again, some of it is, is, is done out of love. I don't, I, I'm not saying that, that it's not or that we don't have the right intentions. But we can just so quickly feel like I've got the whole world in my hands. And so what Jesus does is he encourages us to surrender, but... At some point in your life, you get so exhausted and so overwhelmed and so hopeless. Watch this, because I see this as a pastor. You get to the end of yourself, and then we turn to God. People don't come to church when their marriage is great. They come to it when it's at the end. They come to it when the rehab's not helping the addictions anymore. When that, that's when most people come is when they've lost their purpose, they've lost their way, they've lost everything. And by the way, that's great. This is the place that you should 
come to. But what ends up happening is instead of surrendering to God, we just determine that we have a need for him, and then religion becomes our attempt at controlling God. (laughs) And so what we do is we say, well, I'm going to start going to church, and as I start going to church, then God's going to have to do stuff for me now. And then we start buying into this idea that, okay, oh, well, so if I tithe, then I, then I get back stuff. Okay, so I'll start giving money because God's got to give back to me, and, and I'm going to serve, and, and I'm going to help. And, and all of these things come from not of motivation to really honor God and surrender God and love God. It all really honestly comes from a selfish motivation that as long as I'm doing my part, God, you're doing your part. And at the moment that God stops doing what you think is his part, then you go, I'm done. And so I hear people say this all the time. Well, Pastor Josh, I tried church. I tried church. Just, it just wasn't for me. I tried, I tried this following Jesus thing. I read my Bible for two days. just didn't really work. <laughs> yeah, try to work out for two days and see if you got six-pack abs. How does that work for you? I tried this. I tried, I tried that. I tried to pray. I tried this. Life was just too, too, too hard. My wife still doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I just want to... That, that's because we were trying to use religion to control God. So it's just a different form of, of control. It's just in a spiritual way now. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But how many know God won't be controlled? <laughs> I, uh, I remember when I took driver's ed. I don't know if any of y'all had a driver's ed teacher like I had. When I took driver's ed, um, I came to find out real quickly that um, my driver's ed teacher, so I'm in the driver's seat, my driver's ed teacher had, uh, had pedals on his side too. I don't know if y'all knew that. They had pedals on their side too. And so my driver's ed teacher said, okay, uh, we're, you know, we're doing the driving test and all that stuff. He says, okay, we're coming up to a yellow light. What do we do on a yellow light? And my word was, floor it. <laughs> I mean, you still, I still, that's, that's it. You just, that's, yellow's for going fast. Green is fast, yellows go faster, okay, then red stop, okay? And so floor it. Uh, come to find out, he's got brakes on his side. Uh, so floor it meant he gets to step on the brakes. Watch this. That's how most of us are with relationship with God. You want him to think that he's in control, but you got the brakes on your side. You got the brakes on your side. And that's why, watch this, if you want to write this down, there's no such thing as partial surrender, There's no such thing as partial surrender. I want you to imagine for a moment you woke up in the the middle of an ambulance. You were connected to all sorts of cords and machines, and the EMT, you know, is, is standing over you as you're kind of coming to, and he says, you've been in a terrible accident, but we've got you. We've got you. Just just lay right here and just rest. We've got it. Okay, in that moment, you have the opportunity to decide if you're just going to surrender and let them just take over, or you pop up and go, hey, I want three cc's of this, two cc's of that. I want you to, you start pulling out things like, come on, I mean, you know, like, they'd be like, tranquilizer, tranquilize him right now. He doesn't need your cooperation, like he's, They've perfectly got it. They weren't asking for you to assist them. They were asking for you to surrender them. So that's, listen, you can't say, well, I'm 83% surrendered to Jesus. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good with Jesus. Well, either you're surrendered to him or you're not surrendered to him. You can't say, well, I'll trust God with, with my salvation, but I won't trust him with my marriage. You can't say, I'll, I'll trust God with Uh, the ability to save me and forgive me, but I'm not gonna trust him with my kids. You can't say that, God, I'm I'm gonna gonna trust you to get me to heaven. I'm just not gonna trust you to be able to provide a job for me. Are are y'all with me? Got quiet in this church. (laughs) See, because you need to understand God can do way more with our surrender than he can with our control. God can do way more with our surrender than he can with our control. Notice what God was able to do when Simon says, okay, I'll just let down the nets. I'll just let it go. And in that moment of just letting go of the nets, God says, okay, I got it now. Because how many know, as long as the nets were in Simon's hands, he caught nothing. But as soon as it went into God's hands, he caught everything. And what Simon got a revelation of real quickly is that, hey, this guy that's on my boat has an ability to also control fish. 
pretty powerful. Simon's going to learn real quickly as he follows him, this guy can also not only control fish, he can control the weather. He can control the dead to come back to life. He can make things grow back to where they weren't before. He can make blind eyes open. He can save you, but he also can change the way that you live. He can provide for you. He can make sure that every need that you have is well taken care of. He can look at a tree and curse it. He can look at a tree and grow it. He has the ability to do something. There was something about this man that was so different than everybody else. And so what does it look like for us in the year 2022 to surrender to Christ? I want you to write two thoughts down. Here's two thoughts. And then we're going to come to a close. Number one is this. Surrender is not acknowledgement. Surrender is allegiance. Surrender is not acknowledgement. Surrender is allegiance. See, the fundamental message of the Bible that we read, this book that we read, is about a king and a kingdom. The very first message that Jesus shows up on the scene that I had us read in Mark, Jesus shows up on the scene and says, the kingdom of God is here. It is at hand. Jesus was instituting the fact that there was now a king and there was a kingdom that was on this earth. How many know Jesus Christ was born a king? We didn't make him a king. We didn't vote him as a king. He didn't ask for your voting. And by the way, he was a king before this earth and he'll be a king after this earth. This king, he's king. The Bible says he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. This king, by the way, will never be voted out. This king will never be assassinated. This king will never be trumped. Even though kings and kingdoms have tried to overtake this kingdom, they've never been able to do it. And so Jesus says, I'm instituting a kingdom that is an eternal kingdom, and you need to understand that this kingdom has a king, and I will never be dethroned from it. And the king owns everything. That is why another name for a king is a lord, because a lord means the owner. And so if he is the king of all, If he is the Lord of all, here's the question. If the Bible describes this king and this kingdom, and if Jesus is Lord of all, I believe what the Bible says, no matter if I disagree with it, no matter if I'm angered by it, no matter if I don't understand it, no matter whatever culture says, if the Bible says it because it's his word and it's it's about him as a king and as a kingdom, the question that we've all got to ask ourselves is, Is he Lord? Is he either Lord or is he a liar? Because those are the only two options. If he is a liar, then disregard everything. But if he is Lord, surrender everything. Because listen, Western culture Christianity has made it that following Jesus just means you believe in Jesus. Listen, 90% of people in the U.S. believe that there's a God. Satan believes there's a God. Belief and acknowledgement is nothing. Allegiance and surrender is everything. This is it. And so what has happened is, over the last two years, people's faith has been rocked because they just bought into a belief of who God is. And when you start doubting who God is, of course, you lose your way. But when that is anchored, that God is who he says he is, that God is a king, and that he instituted Jesus to come as a king, introducing a new way of doing things, a kingdom, a kingdom way, then, then I, I only have two options. I can do it my way or his way. That's the only way. Those are the only options. But you can't mix a little bit of your way and his way. His way. I'm I'm, I'm just telling you right now. Most of us want God's blessings, but we want to do it our way. You don't get God's blessings without doing it God's way. And that's in every way that God has called us to. So, So surrender is not an acknowledgement. It's an allegiance. And number two is that surrender is not a one-time event. Surrender is a daily choice. Well, you say, well, Pastor Josh, like, I prayed the prayer. I got baptized. I said, yes, Jesus is Lord. 
Well, listen, it's not the initial yes that shows your faith. It's the follow through. Do you still have faith on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and next month and next month and next year and next year and the year after that and the year after that? The question is not, does your life declare today or the question isn't, did you pray the prayer or did you get baptized? The question is, does your life today declare that he is Lord? Are you surrendered now? I put it, I'll put it another way. If you wanna write this down. It's not what your mouth says that determines if you have faith. It's what your life says. Well, I believe in Jesus. I go to our Savior's church. Well, good for you. But that doesn't mean you're fully surrendered to Jesus. And I'm glad you're here. But I'm just telling you, you being in church doesn't make you a people of the way just as much as you and going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Come on, somebody. You might smell like it, but you ain't it. Getting into church, going to church, are all great things. I have a whole series on the power of being the church and being in the church. But being the church is much more than attending a service. It's much more than sitting in a seat Jesus didn't die so we could sit in a seat. Jesus died so that your life could be changed, your marriage could be changed, your children could be changed, that you could leave a legacy of of generosity, of humility, of, of, of gratitude, of faith, of peace, of purpose. It's not a one time event. Every morning I've got to wake up and I go, God, today I surrender my life to you. God, today, not my will, but your will be done. I mean, when Jesus said yes to coming to, to, to the earth, that was a surrender. And then when Jesus had to go to the cross, that was a surrender. And then when he was in the garden, that was a surrender. And every time he wanted to slap on them disciples for being stupid, that was a surrender. Come on, somebody. Like, God, God, I surrender this to you. God, I surrender this to you. God, I surrender this to you. And what, we, what, what, what you're gonna see over these next five weeks, and I'm gonna show you this, because in this moment, the Bible says, look, look, what, look what happened in Luke chapter five, uh, verse eight. Watch this moment. I'm, I want you to see the moment of surrender for Simon. Verse eight says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, what did he do? Yeah. Fell to his knees. You know what that is? That's a sign of surrender. A sign of surrender. He fell to his knees before Jesus and he says, oh Lord, Please leave me. I am such a sinful man. Listen, you may be 20 inches away from full surrender. You say, well, what's 20 inches? It's not from the head to the heart. It's from the knees to the ground. It's from the knees to the ground. Some of us are 20 inches away. Watch this. Some of us are 20 inches away from our marriage being radically different. Some of us are 20 inches away from our life being radically different. Some of us are 20 inches away. Because watch this. Control is standing. Surrender is kneeling. And this is what we get from Simon in this moment. He's kneeling before the Lord. And what Simon in this moment of surrender, Simon, if you, if you fast forward the story, Jesus renames him, calls him Peter. Simon becomes Peter. Peter becomes the leading, the leading apostle of the church. Y'all, y'all realize that? And then, and then as the leading apostle of the church, to where we are today, all started with this moment, a moment of surrender. But you're gonna see because I don't wanna, I don't wanna preach my Easter message yet. but we're gonna circle back on Simon at Easter because Simon surrendered to Jesus right here, but along the journey, he got back up and thought, I can do this on my own. I got this on my own, more to come. But I want you to see what William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, he said this, the greatness of a man's power is in the measure of his surrender. The greatness of a man's power is in the measure of his surrender. 
So here's my question, all right? Last question of the day. And I want you just to really ask the Holy Spirit this question right here. Here's the question. And I believe he's gonna, he's gonna give you an answer. What are you trying to control that God wants you to surrender? What is it that you're trying to control that God wants you to surrender? Is it a relationship? Is it your health? Is it someone that you love? Is it your finances? Is it your job? Is it your bank account? Is it your future? Is it your children? What is it that God is calling you to yield to, to give up control, to release to him? What is that? Matthew 10, 39 says, whoever finds their life, whoever holds on to their life, I got this, I can do this. What do they do? They what? They lose it. They lose it. And whoever loses their life, whoever gives up their life, whoever surrenders their life, for my sake, they're gonna find it. Everybody listen to me. You don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control, but you do have the power to surrender. The power to surrender your status, the power to surrender your personality, the, po the power to surrender your preferences, the power to surrender your way, the power to surrender and, and, and just go, God, I, I, just, I, I say yes, I surrender it all. The reason why William Booth could say what he said, the greatness of a man's power is the measure of a surrender. If you go and you read the story of William Booth, it was because God began to capture his heart for the poor. And God began to capture his heart for what he could do for the poor and what he could do in Salvation Army, of course, now because of his yes that he gave to Jesus, Salvation Army is in 130 countries all around the world because a man was willing just to say, yes, I surrender it to you. I surrender it to you. I liken it to the, the difference between someone who gives God a blank check and someone who gives God a gift card. Some of us have given God a gift card with an expiration date and if God doesn't do such and such until such and such, you're out. But what would it look like if we said, God, no, you just have a blank check, I've already signed it and the answer's yes. The answer's yes. God, whatever you wanna do in my business, the answer's yes. Whatever you wanna do in my life, the answer's yes. Whatever you wanna do in my family, the answer is yes. And the only deal that God is willing to make for his gift of righteousness is your total surrender. My, your, your surrender, his righteousness. How many know that is the greatest trade ever in the history of all trades? God, I surrender it all. I surrender it all. So I asked our worship team to, to come back up here and I wanna end today actually um, with us just declaring this before the Lord. I want us to declare uh, that he has our heart, that he has it all, that maybe there's those of you in here, you know you haven't given them your all. You haven't given them everything. You've surrendered parts of it. Um, and maybe even you're ever doing kind of some religious things that, that look good on the outside, but really there's a transformation that God's going after. He is going after your heart today. And so I want you to do this. Would you just bow your heads all across this room? Just, and the only reason we do that is just, because I believe we can just be in a distraction-free moment where the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. So right now, just ask that question. Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What is it that's in my life that I need to give up control and I need to surrender? What is that right now? Holy Spirit, speak. God, to those right now that are watching online, that are there, God, what is it, Lord, that we've held on to? Maybe fear, we've held on to fear. We've held on to insecurity. We've held on to worry. God's going, I can, I can do way more with your surrender than I can with your control. What are you willing to give up? What nets are you willing to let down? What are those things in your life right now? We're gonna be people of surrender. Holy Spirit, you just speak right now. Holy Spirit, speak. If you're here in this, in this room or you're watching online right now, and if you were being completely honest, you've never surrendered your entire life to Jesus. The Bible calls this being born again. And I love that, that picture of being born again. No person can be physically reborn, but we can be spiritually reborn, that God comes and he brings us from death to life. And it begins with surrender. Really, salvation at the end of the day is total surrender. God, 
save me. I cannot do this on my own. There's not enough good works. There's not enough times I can go to church. There's no pastor, no priest, no program. There's nothing that I can do that can earn the grace of God. It is freely given to you and I, and we just receive it. We repent of ruling and leading and being the Lord of our life, and we turn to him, and the Bible says that he is faithful to forgive. He's righteous to cleanse. So here in this room, if you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, if you're watching online, say, man, I wanna surrender it all today. I wanna make him the Lord of my life. I want you just to pray this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. My past, my pains, my sins, my selfishness. Thank you for sending Jesus to live a life that I couldn't live and dying a death that I deserve to die. Today, I recognize you as the Lord and Savior of my life. Today, I surrender it all to you. Tomorrow, I surrender it all to you. And the next day, I surrender it all to you. Thank you for giving me grace and righteousness and forgiveness. Cleanse me. Make me new. Give me a new heart. In Jesus' name, amen.